I cracked the coding interview in under three months. As a computer science freshman, I pretty much knew nothing when it came to data structures, algorithms, leak code, all that stuff was foreign to me. But then fast forward a couple months down the line, I find myself successfully passing a final round interview at Amazon for a software engineering internship as a freshman once again. In this video, I'm gonna give you the exact roadmap to studying for the coding interview and walk you through step-by-step step how I would solve one of these coding problems. So first things first, we need to understand our different problem types. We got easy, medium, and hard. In terms of the easy ones, these are the super basic ones. Reverse a string, reverse a linked list, fizzbuzz, in which you print either fizz, buzz, or fizzbuzz, depending on if the number can be divided by three, five, or both. Some other problems I've seen is a palindrome check in which you check if a string is a palindrome. Find the maximum number in an array in which you go through the array and keep a track of which one is the max. Sum all the elements within an array in which you go through the array and add up all the elements. Find the factorial of a number in which you can either use a for loop or recursion. Merge two sorted arrays in which you have to construct a whole new array after sorting two different arrays. So as you can see, there's some pretty simple easy questions that can easily weed out people who have no clue what computer science is fundamentally. But how do you actually prep for these? Well, first of all, if you don't know how to solve any of these problems, well, I have some bad news for you. Software engineering, you might not be ready yet. But if you're an absolute beginner and you're ready to give it a shot, well, I recommend going through some introductory coursework through like object-oriented programming, even AP computer science that most high schools can cover a good amount of these concepts. If you're absolutely new to programming, check out CS50. It'll teach you a lot of introductory programming concepts through Scratch as well as project-based learning. And then once you're a level above that, check out codedex.io. It's this game-like environment. I think it was modeled off of Legend of Zelda in which you go through an adventure and as you're going through you solve different coding questions. Literally one of the assignments they have you doing is FizzBuzz itself and once you pass through all of that you should be good and ready to solve most of these problems. But then sometimes within the basic realm you have a little bit of a curveball question. One time for example I was asked to implement the filter function within JavaScript. And guess what? Those introductory classes don't really prep you for it, but still a basic problem. And so what do you do? Well, you learn basic level things within each of these languages. For example, JavaScript, one resource that I have is HackerRank. They have a program called 10 Days of JavaScript in which they give you different exercises every single day for you to solve. From the basics of loops, arrays, try, catch, inheritance, bitwise operators, regular expressions, like everything that you need combined into this one free resource. Other than that, in this category, they might ask you simple things. Like if you have React on your resume, they might ask you what the state management system is like. If you have Java on your resume, they might ask you, hey, explain to me how the garbage collector works within Java. So you probably want to have some experience before you throw these languages onto your resume. Obviously you don't lie, but you don't need to be an expert either. Next up, we have the medium level problems, the leak code problem, the data structures and algorithms problems, and this is gonna be the meats of the video. If you actually haven't taken data structures and algorithms in university yet, do not worry. In fact, me as a freshman, when I applied for Amazon, I hadn't taken it and I was successful through it and I believe anyone else can as well. So first thing is we need to learn data structures and algorithms on our own. And one of the best tools I have found how I learned data structures and algorithms is csvistool.com. It was actually developed by Georgia Tech. This is our class CS1332. So let me show you why it's so good. In here, you can select many different data structures, many different algorithms. And let's just say we take an array list, for example. And I want to add the number two to the front of the array list. So it'll show the visualization of it being added as well as the code along with it. You can add another one and you can see exactly what line it goes through in the code. So you actually visually see it and piece it into your mind how to actually code it up. Another example, Dijkstra's algorithm, one of the most popular algorithms in technical coding interviews. This made it so easy for me to understand. So I put my start vertex and I run it through and I can literally see as it's going through the code, how it's traversing through the graph, what the situation is like for every data structure it's using, like the priority queue, the distance map, and how things are being moved around. And hey, if it's going a little too fast for me, I can adjust the animation speed down here and slow it down or I can speed it up. I'm not sponsored by them in any way, but I just think it's excellent for any starter to just really understand how these coding algorithms and data structures work. And the best thing about it, it's in pseudocode. So if you have Python experience, Java experience, JavaScript experience, anyone should be able to understand it. After that, before we're ready for any sort of coding interviews, we need to understand the math behind these data structures and algorithms. And for that, we have big O notation. And for that, I recommend you check out Geeks for Geeks. It has a whole nice article 
article on how big O works in general. First, it'll actually explain the math. It'll show you this nice graph of how effectively things work and what big O notation is and why we effectively use it. It'll go through kind of like the different properties associated with it. Like for example, something that is O of 2N is actually just O of N and how the things within like the sum rule and product rule effectively work. I'm not gonna go in depth. That's not the point of this video. My point of this video is just to kind of give you the resources. And by the way, all the links will be in the description below if you guys wanna check out. It'll also give you specific examples of why just a simple for loop is an O of N operation and why something in which you're breaking down and only going into one side recursively can be something O of log N, why something like a nested for loop is typically O of N squared, why something as a triple nested loop can be O of N cubed. Super nice, very easy to read. I think this is a great starter place for most people if you have no clue what big O is. After that, once you got a grasp of it, once you got the theory down really in your head, I want you to check out this site called Big O Cheat Sheet. It pretty much has every single data structure, every single algorithm that you can pretty much ever see on a technical coding interview. And it has the exact big O notation for each of like the average case, the worst case, or like for the algorithms, the best case, just kind of have this memorized in the back of your mind. Sometimes interviewers will ask you maybe at the beginning of the interview, what's the best case scenario for this? What's the best case scenario for this? And it just helps if you have it memorized. I don't recommend starting with this because after all, it is a cheat sheet. It's only used as a guide once you get the theory down because if someone asks you, hey, why is merge score n log in? You should be able to explain it without having to be like, oh shoot, I just memorized a cheat sheet. So once we've learned everything, now we actually have to roll up our sleeves and actually do leet code prep. And for that, I'm gonna pull up a sample problem and actually walk through you step by step how exactly I would approach it and how I would solve it. So first thing, I'm gonna look at the question. So it's called a two sum. Given an array of integer nums and an integer target, return indices of the two numbers such that they add up to target. You may assume that each input would have exactly one solution and you may not use the same element twice. You can return the answer in any order. An example, the nums two, seven, 11, and 15 if you have a target of nine, it'll return zero and one because the indices at zero and the indice at one or the elements at that point, two plus seven equals nine. So we return zero, one. If the nums is three, two, four, and we have a target of six, it'll output one and two because two plus four is six. Okay, so this somewhat makes sense to me. Um, and we're given exactly what we're doing. So I'm gonna code this up in Python. First things first, if I'm in a coding interview, I'll usually start by asking about edge cases. Okay, what if there's a negative number? Or what if the array is empty? What if something is null? Do I have to account for those conditions? And the reason I do that is one, I actually look kind of smart because I'm considering a lot of edge cases. Two, it gives me a little bit more time to kind of think through a potential solution. And now I'm just gonna kind of blurt out what I think immediately comes to my mind. I don't care about any optimization. I just need to get some solution down what we call the brute force solution. Obviously one way I could do this is iterate through a nested loop going through this array. So I'm gonna do this. For i in range len nums and then I'm gonna do a nest within that. For j in range from i comma len of nums if nums of i plus nums of j equals target return i comma j if it doesn't we shouldn't have to return anything. I'll just return none. This should, in theory, work. I'm gonna try running it. Let's see what it is. Oh, okay, it looks like I got something wrong. So let me take a look. How can I debug this? So I got this case right. Why did I get case two wrong? So I'm actually gonna take a look at it. Um, oh, so I got this case wrong. It, anyone know what the, the bug is? Call it out in the comments if you see it. Well, because I actually added 
three, it, it got the indices zero and zero. So what I'm actually going to do is do i plus one and try running it again. And in this case, I actually passed all three cases. Now, if we were to take a look at the time complexity of any of these, this is atrocious. This is what we call O of n squared because there's two loops kind of going around this. So how do we optimize it? So I'm going to put on my creative hat and start thinking, huh, how can we optimize it? And then after a couple of minutes, while I'm doing this prep, I have no idea. On the interview, maybe I'll talk to the interview and all that, but if I'm sitting alone, I can't just get frustrated and not do anything. So I'm pulling up my best resource. This is the Geeks for Geeks article about Tusum. And the reason I like Geeks for Geeks is it gives you so much information. It gives you sample inputs, outputs for the problem that you're dealing with. It shows you the naive approach, which is the approach that I already solved, the O of N squared. It gives you a better approach a best approach. And the nice thing about it, it does it in many different programming languages. So it's perfect for anyone. It gives you the exact like time complexities and it actually gives you visual diagrams so you can understand it as you're going. Now, the one caveat with this is the problem is slightly different in that uh, this is more about like the output being true or false rather than it being the exact indices that we want but it's fine. I'm still going to look at it. Obviously, I won't copy and paste. I mean, obviously, since the problem's not the same, but even if it's not, do not copy and paste. Otherwise, you actually don't learn anything. So let's actually look through the best approach and see how they do it. So in this best approach, what do they do? Create an empty hash set or an un order set. Iterate through the array for each number in the array. Calculate the component target minus current number. Check if the complement exists in the set. If it is, then pair found. If it isn't, add the current number to the set. If the loop completes without finding a pair, return that no pair exists. We don't have to worry about it because we're guaranteed a solution exists in our case. So as you can see, they have a set, they iterate through it, they find the complement. So they do the target minus the dumb, see if that exists and return true. Now, the thing is, we can't exactly use a set in our case because we actually need to keep track of the indices but we can use the similar thing instead of a hash set, we can use a hash map. Um, but in our case, in Python, it's not a hash map, it's a dictionary, so we'll use that. So we're back in our lead code and I'm gonna comment this out. I wanna use a hash map in order to make things a little more efficient. So first thing I'm gonna call this is my nums dict. I'm gonna create an empty uh, dictionary for it. Then I actually need to iterate through the array and I need to check for the complements by basically ensuring like if we're going through two, then seven, if nine minus two exists within the thing, I need to uh, notify that down. So first I'm gonna iterate through the array. Okay. I need to calculate what that complement value is. Is target minus nums of i. And I need to check if that complement already exists within the dictionary. Nums. So it'll have the indices of that as well as I. And then if it doesn't exist, we actually need to add it to the dictionary. So what I'm going to do is nums dict of nums of I should equal I. I'm not entirely sure if this will work, but let me try. Okay, looks like it passed. If you don't understand it, so I'll add comments. This is the dictionary. This is loop through array. This is calculate complement. This is check if complement exists. This is return indices found. This is store in indices map if exists. 
So as you can see, I took like this hash set example that I found within Geeks for Geeks. I knew I had to use some hashing because that's how you actually bring it down to O of N because a lookup in hash sets or hash maps is all O of one maximum. So I just looped this through this array just once. I do use extra space, which is O of N space, which is a little more than what we used in the previous one, but overall we save a lot of time going through this approach. And I know I mentioned there's an easy, medium, and hard. The hard, I'll probably have to save for another video. Subscribe if you want to follow along for that. And that's more of system designs things. For example, how would you go about setting up the architecture of Discord? How would you go about setting up the architecture of Netflix and dealing with a lot of things like bandwidth, latency, a lot of complicated terms that I don't have enough time for this video. And so if you want to take a look. This book that I'm going to put up on the screen is generally good for problems like that. But overall, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you actually are able to pass technical interviews after watching this video. And if you guys have any questions, let me know in the comments below. If you like the video, hit subscribe, hit like if you haven't already. And if you want to find out exactly what software engineers specifically at Google do on a day to day basis, you might like this video right here.